Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar on trauma-informed practice. We're going to wait another minute for some more teachers to join us and we'll be underway very, very soon. Good evening, teachers. Welcome to this special installment of the Teach Starter webinar series. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the owners of the land that I'm on today. Um, I'm in the Teach Starter offices here on the north bank of the Brisbane River, so that's Turbal country, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. My name is Michael, and I produce these webinars. Now, usually we have one of the Teach Starter teachers hosting, but today you are all the teachers, and I'm here to facilitate a conversation between all of you and our two fantastic guests, and I'll introduce you to them in a moment. Now, I can see that you've all discovered the chat feature, which is fantastic, and you might be wondering how to turn off that notification sound while all those messages come in. Um, you'll hear that if you're in one of the other tabs. Uh, you can do that by clicking the little bell icon at the top of the chat panel. My colleague Holly is with us tonight, and she'll be there to chat with you throughout the webinar. Uh, Holly, if you're there, I'll get you to say hi. Now, at the bottom of the chat panel, you'll also see a tab for polls and one for questions. Now, we're going to use both of those this evening. And I've just published a poll for you to participate in. So this is a Q&A, and our guests will be responding to your questions. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to ask them, please use the question tab. Um, and on that polls tab, um, the poll that I have put up, um, in case you are watching this on a replay or you are not able to interact with that for any reason, the question is, have you completed training on trauma-informed practice before? We're going to come back to that one in a minute. Okay, this session is going to be one hour long and it is being recorded, so I'll send that recording out to everyone who's registered later this evening. And please feel free to share that with your colleagues as well, if you like. The content and the slides that are going to be presented tonight are the intellectual property of our guest speakers at their institutions, and Teach Data assumes no ownership of that content by broadcasting it. Okay, I'm really excited to introduce our two guests this evening, and I'll ask them to join the stage with me now. I'll give them a second to do that. Here they come. Okay, we have Dr. Karen Martin, who is Professor of Trauma-Informed Pedagogy at the University of Tasmania, and she is brand new at the University of Tasmania, having only started there in the last couple of weeks. So I'm very grateful that you've made the time to speak with us this evening, Karen. Pleasure. <laughs> and we have Dr. Emily Berger, who is an educational and developmental psychologist and a senior lecturer in educational psychology at Monash University. And she's also an adjunct senior research adjunct senior research fellow with the school of rural health at monash um, thank you emily for joining us as well thank you michael uh, tonight we're going to start with a short presentation from each of our guests um, before we open up to a general q a but if you have questions during those presentations please send them through on the questions tab and we're going to try and get through as many of them as we possibly can first though We've got this poll, and let me have a quick look at that. Okay. Um, so, two, 
62% uh, uh, of you say that you have not completed training in trauma-informed practice before. 38% say that you have. Um, I'll go to you, Emily, because Karen's about to talk for a little while. Um, how does that track with what you know teachers' exposure to this topic uh, really is? Yeah, it's probably getting a little bit higher. Uh, so surveys that we did uh, probably about five years ago, I can't remember the exact numbers, but they were definitely lower than those numbers. So I think it just shows the popularity of this topic and the awareness and knowledge around this topic is is growing. So it's probably higher than, than what I would have anticipated based on, right on. on prior surveys. So um, we're starting out with um, a, a good understanding of the topic in the room, um, which is a good place to start for, for this Q&A. Um, 500 of you uh, participated in that poll. So I can see that you have figured out how to use it and we'll come back to that later in the session. Okay, we're gonna go to you now, Karen. Um, uh, if you would like to share your slides. Sure, okay. Can you see them now? That's perfect. Okay, Great. I'll leave you to it. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. And thank you all um, for joining us. Really excited to be here. Emily and I work together quite a lot, so we love presenting together. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians on the land that I'm actually presenting from today, the um, Wadjuk Noongar people. I'm actually in, I'm back in Perth momentarily um, before I go um, back to Tasmania. Um, I would like to pay my respects to the elders past present and emerging um, on this land and I'd further extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples all throughout Australia. Um, those joining us today but also I noticed that um, there are some people from New Zealand which is exciting so I extend my respect to Indigenous people in um, New Zealand. So as Michael said I've just started at the University of Tasmania last week very exciting um, and my job there will be in basically promoting trauma-informed practice learning and teaching um, in schools um, and further afield and um, in Tasmania the Department of Education over there are really committed to getting all of their teachers trauma informed so we're really excited about that. Um, I come from UWA, I actually have a public health um, PhD um, and I um, really enjoy working in this area and um, disseminating some of the information about trauma and adversity um, and how it impacts physical as well as mental health. So basically my research lately has been on trying to encourage schools and the education sectors to understand how um, childhood adversity and trauma impacts children. Um, and I try and use evidence whenever I can to assist schools um, in how to respond uh, to the impact that um, trauma and adversity has. And I've said avoid re-traumatizing children, but also um, in trauma, we try and ask schools to avoid traumatizing children as well. Um, we are also going to be setting up some new coursework at the University of Tasmania in trauma-informed um, teaching and trauma-informed um, education. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that coursework. I do just want to flag today that um, sometimes uh, you might find talking about adversity and trauma in childhood um, does generate strong emotions for audience members um, and it has done in the past. If you need to leave the session please do, you can always listen at a later stage if you feel like you want to, um, but please um, no matter what, if you're feeling a bit stressed and upset and um, it doesn't feel right, please get some um, expert support. Of course, if there's an emergency um, mental health problem for you, ensure that you dial triple zero. Um, and there's some other um, services online that you can look into who have free um, assistance um, should you require it. So, um, I, I can see some of you already have some training in trauma-informed practice, but I do want to revisit the definition of adversity and trauma, particularly as the word trauma gets bandied around a lot um, and is often not defined accurately. Um, and if we don't understand 
uh, the true meaning of adversity and trauma, then we don't really understand um, how children might display um, some of the impacts of adversity and trauma. And what we really want to do is understand how um, childhood experiences um, impact behaviour, learning, um, and also the physiology of a child. So as I do this, I'm just going to walk you through this sort of new model I've developed. Bear with me. But basically, you may have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences um, Study. If you haven't, I encourage you to look it up on the slides um, that you will get. You basically can click on the links and it'll um, take you to the information that I'm presenting. So that started in America and it basically started quite a few years ago and it looked at the association between um, nine and then 10 specific childhood experiences that were considered adverse and their outcomes for adults. Um, and those um, adverse experiences can be classified into abuse, neglect and household dysfunction. So that was things like domestic violence, sexual abuse, um, neglect, um, over, um, uh, over sort of parents who are overly dominating and controlling to the point that it's it's creating adversity for the child. Lately, there's been an increased understanding about how um, there's ad expanded adverse experiences. These ACEs adverse experiences don't actually include things like bullying, racism, and natural disasters, and of course, um, now COVID. So, for some of these children, they won't actually experience trauma from those adverse experiences. Um, and we need to be aware that not all children um, respond in the same way. And we do hear that quite a lot, that for some child, um, they might find an experience creates trauma and for another child, it may not. But if you have one or more experiences that are particularly upsetting to the point that um, you fear for your life or it's your emotions are so strong that you wouldn't expect someone um, to feel that normally, they're really intense, distressing emotions, then that is um, a response which can be considered trauma. There are some clear definitions of what what trauma is, um, but it's uh, at the same time, it's quite, um, it's a term that's debated in the literature. Trauma can heal or resolve, usually with some um, expert input or intervention, but it also can lead to outcomes like post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociation, increase your risk of um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and oppositional defiance disorder and other mental and behavioural outcomes. But um, there's a new um, uh, definition of uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is um, an internationally recognised disease classification system. It's only just come on board lately. Um, unfortunately, in Australia, we don't follow it. But complex post-traumatic stress disorder is basically um, what a lot of people call complex trauma. Um, it's basically where you have multiple experiences in your childhood of abuse, neglect or um, tr uh, trauma that has an ongoing um, impact on you. And it's considered um, that the impact is higher or long lasting than from a single incident that leads to post-traumatic stress disorder. It's usually a single incident um, for post-traumatic stress disorder, but not always. So then we've got um, children uh, who do not experience um, adversity and um, they're very few, <laughs> to be honest. Actually, um, there's only actually 30% um, when we look at the ACEs study um, from America who have no childhood adverse experiences. So um, it's actually a small percentage of the population. Um, a lot of people have one or more. But um, what we do know is that the more adverse experiences you um, feel as a child, the more likely you are to have um, challenging responses. And I've used the word challenge instead of abnormal because actually your physiology, your social skills, your learning and your behaviour um, are responses that are actually um, life preserving uh, responses to your experiences as a child. 
um, as a child when you're experiencing um, adversity or trauma. So children who experience no adversity, um, of course, are healthier. So that's something that we want to be aware of. It's not just children who've experienced trauma who have these um, more negative outcomes, but it's also child children who experience forms of adversity. So we end up with this cycle of distress. And basically we have where children experience trauma or adversity often at the home, sometimes community, sometimes at school. It may have a trauma impact, but we also know there's some other um, negative impacts such as your physiology, and there's actually quite a lot of research showing that now, your social skills, et cetera. That often impacts your behavior, and your behavior can be um, uh, excessively disrespectful, aggressive, but also some children will internalize that and um, they may be uh, very emotional, easily, easily upset, um, very quiet and excessively introverted. Um, the school often in our society reprimands, shames, um, embarrasses these ch children or punishes them. And um, what we actually think is that this um, has a negative effect on these children. And in fact, the research is starting to demonstrate that um, impact. And we know children who are suspended have much more negative outcomes. Um, and it's often called the school to prison pipeline um, you may have heard of. So the thing is that when the school responds in this way and including being ignored or dismissed, it's actually important to respond. Um, experiences of um, self-harm, for instance, are sometimes seen as a social contagion, but actually um, they're a sign that something is, is deeply wrong and should not be dismissed or ignored as something that all the girls are doing, which is what I've heard teachers say to me before and school leaders. So what happens is these children, they feel further pain, humiliation, anger, frustration, um, and often their behavior may become worse in the home and it leads to further um, distress and um, behavioural issues. And we end up with this cycle that is almost cumulative, um, particularly for some children. So what do we do? Well, you know, this is, it's not all bad news. Um, I think what we do need to be aware of and know that um, actually, if we can give children positive experiences, it can help uh, mitigate some of uh, what negative impacts these children may have. And it's in the school environment or in the community where children are um, often going to get these positive experiences. For children who have a negative experience at school, often it's their families that offer those positive experience that help reduce some of that harm um, that can be done. If you want to hear more about um, the impact of trauma on children's behaviour um, and their development, um, there's a document here that was produced by um, Department of Communities in Victoria, but many um, Department of Education and Communities in each state refer to this document. Um, you can download it um, from the WA website or it's also on the other state websites. So um, what does a trauma-informed teacher or leader do? Um, basically, uh, we don't really know as far as the research goes um, what a trauma-informed teacher looks like. There's a, a real um, we're, we're at the start of this research um, area, but we do know, um, we have some ideas as, what, as to what a trauma-informed teacher looks like based on um, how teachers respond um, to a child in a way that connects with them, that develops a strong relationship where they um, understand the child and respond in a way that demonstrates they understand the child and they put the child first. So trying to remain calmly professional and continuous control is important. Using behaviour modification techniques rather than policing is quite important. Accompany behavioural requests with rationale. Explain why you're asking a child to move, for example. Um, and articulating and enforcing rules, but also ensuring stu uh, students understand why there are rules for this particular um, circumstance. It's actually important to ensure rules are uh, enforced. Trauma-informed practice does not mean letting children get away with bad behaviour. It's 
actually really important to guide positive behaviour and correct behaviour that can be unsafe um, or damaging and give choice whenever possible. And that helps um, children have some control and agency over what they do. Um, there's a really good um, discussion about trauma-informed teaching strategies um, at this website. I, uh, Jessica's a psychologist, she has some great insight. And hopefully over the next few years, we can build some really good research um, about what a trauma-informed teacher actually looks like and does. But many of you are probably already um, practicing in a very trauma-informed way anyway um, but what we really want to do is to try and disseminate how to do that um, consistently um, but also in a whole school environment we want all teachers to be trauma-informed you may have a very trauma-informed classroom but your um, uh, the rest of the teachers in the school may not be as trauma informed um, and that can be damaging for a child. I can see I'm starting to go um, a bit over time. Sorry, Michael, I'll hurry up. So what does a trauma informed school look like? Well, we have done a little bit of research and we've actually extracted some common themes from trauma informed practice programs that promote um, how schools should be trauma-informed. And we've developed what we've called uh, trauma-informed practice principles or best practice principles for trauma-informed schools. This can be found on our website. So we extracted common themes from these um, international programs. Then we asked Australian and international experts, what do you think of these principles? Is this what a trauma-informed school looks like? And we made some modifications and, and then finalised them. We're trialling these in some schools in WA and, and hope to expand that. Um, but we're, we're trialling these um, principles with some support materials and coaching as well. Um, as I said, more information online. One last thing that I just want to um, highlight to you, you may have heard of the NCCD or Nationally Consistent Collection of Data. Um, basically, uh, the Australian government receives reports of children who have a diagnosed or imputed disability and adjustments made for them within each school. Basically, this year, there's a new section, which is students affected by trauma, which is really um, good news. Um, however, they still have to have a diagnosed disability um, to meet all the other um, NCC, uh, to meet the requirements um, for funding. But I just wanted to flag that because I think um, that's something that uh, principals and teachers need to be aware of um, that's new in those um, guidelines and in that um, funding and uh, collection of data. That's it from me. So um, back to you, Michael, now I'll um, just stop my share. Thanks for that, Karen. Um, we uh, have a few questions about your slides. So um, we're going to uh, make sure we try and get those slides to um, everyone, uh, hopefully later in the session. If not, definitely afterwards. Um, while we're digesting all of that information, I've just put up another poll for everyone. And uh, I can see 100 of you have already found it. So. Um, uh, this one asks, how confident do you feel when supporting children who you suspect may be impacted by trauma? And the options are not at all, somewhat, moderately or very. And I'll give you a few minutes to um, respond to that one. Uh, Karen, while we're doing that, um, we had a couple, we had quite a few questions come through while you were speaking. And I see that Emily has been busy trying to answer some of them as we go. Um, there was... Uh, just a question, I, I think while we're talking about um, uh, what trauma looks like um, and uh, exactly how we're defining it, um, this question from Donna asks, could you call parents going through a divorce as a traumatic experience, even if there was no abuse, et cetera, involved? Um it is actually, um, par parents separating is actually considered an adverse child experience. Um, and so that whole, uh, I guess, in a way, destruction of what they consider their um, safe environment. Um, but that, I mean, that might not always 
be traumatic for a child. Um, it may, uh, some children may adapt better than others, uh, but definitely children whose parents are going through a separation or divorce are probably uh, more vulnerable. And um, it's important to consider the potential impact of that on them and not just in the immediate sort of um, few weeks, but um, for the next, you know, few months, uh, they, and and potentially even longer. So, yeah, that could be, could be considered um, adversity. Thanks, thanks for that, Karen. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions also around this term cycle of distress, um, uh, asking where exactly that has come from, and um, <laughs> I'm sure that you can speak to that. Okay, I, I look. I've actually created some of these models myself. Um, sure. It's based on a lot of the reading and literature um, in this field. So basically, um, and you know, I'm happy for people if you feel that you agree with that um, to use it. Uh, it's basically a concept that um, I think is supported by the literature, and what we really do know is that children who experience adversity and trauma, um, their physiology is impacted. We have evidence that um, there are regions of the brain that are actually smaller in children who've experienced um, or been impacted by trauma um, as opposed to children who haven't. Um, this is usually when they're adults that they're doing um, these types of research, there's always limitations, of course, but also um, activity in different areas of the brain is different. Um, there's an absolute wealth of information. Um, and I've actually got a really good article that I can share, which provides a summary. It's a research review of the physiological impacts. But we also know that um, behaviour and emotional um, regulation is, is different for these children as well. Um, so then I guess the whole way that schools respond um, is pretty much what um, we hear and what is evident in the research. And, um, you know, really what we end up with is it, it's a very much our society, the punishment and um, is just how many Western or well, many societies um, believe is a good way of responding to children who are displaying dysfunctional type behaviours. And it's, um, it's a real challenge to try and change that perception and belief system. But we do know that restorative practices are more effective than punishment. Um, and if we really want to make a change and to improve the behavior and the learning of these children, then we need to take a different approach. Um, and, you know, for a lot of these kids, they've already experienced a really tough time at home. So to go to school and experience a tough time um, then is often why they stop attending um, and why they become disengaged, disenfranchised as well. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Karen. And um... Uh, if you send, uh, we had quite a lot of um, reacts while you were talking about um, uh, the the article you were referencing. So if you send that through to me, I'll make sure that I get them sure. that to our teachers can I, as well. Can I upload um, documents that people can download here? Do we know or not? Um, uh, I don't think we'll try and troubleshoot that during this session, but um, <laughs> if you I can get that to me, not? we'll... <laughs> Okay. We're going to try and fit in as many questions as we possibly can, sure. Karen. So um, I will just go to that poll that we've um, been running. 567 of you have participated in that. Um, the question was, how confident are you when, how confident do you feel when supporting children who you suspect may be impacted by trauma? 45% um, say somewhat confident. 38% said moderately confident. 10% not at all confident, and 7% of you are very confident in supporting <laughs> those children. I'm going to ask uh, Emily to rejoin us on the stage now. Emily, thank you for jumping in and answering some of those questions for us. That's great.
That's all right. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. <laughs> I know they were popping off, weren't they? Um, okay, let's uh, let's jump into your uh, presentation. We're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, Emily has uh, uh, one of her research interests is really fascinating, and I'm I'm going to get her to uh, to lead off into that. Um, so over to you, Emily. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And thank you, Karen. It's always lovely to work with you. Thank you for um, sharing that that lovely um, introduction um, and some of some of the work as well. Uh, I just want to, before I begin, uh, I just want to uh, pay my respects um, to the people of the Kulin Nations on the lands uh, where I'm coming from today um, and pay my respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I also want to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are viewing this video or joining us uh, tonight um, and pay my sincerest respects to the traditional owners of, of the lands where you're all coming from uh, today. Uh, so this is, uh, Michael gave a lovely introduction. So this is just a, a little bit uh, about me, uh, but, but Michael gave a lovely introduction. Basically, my background is as a, as a psychologist. I work as a child and family psychologist in a paediatric clinic. Uh, and I also work uh, as a senior lecturer and adjunct uh, research fellow in, uh, at Monash University across a couple of our uh, faculties and schools. So uh, what I thought I'd talk about is in relation to something we've been talking about a lot over the last couple of years in, is in relation to, to COVID. Uh, because as Karen mentioned, trauma is very common. And what we're finding through our research, all of us have experienced COVID-19. And what we're finding through our research is that COVID-19 is having similar impacts on kids to what you would expect from other disaster experiences and events and other trauma. Um, based experiences and events as well. And Stephen um, Porges, who's quite well known in the area of trauma, uh, described it as the ongoing threat of COVID-19. And I've used that quote uh, a few times now because I think it really captures what, what's been happening, the, the ups and downs. I'm based in Victoria, so I very much know the ups and downs of lockdowns and restrictions uh, from COVID and, and school closures. Uh, and also uh, there's a note there about the increases in family violence. And as, as Karen said, the more traumas you experience, uh, and if you have a prior mental health difficulty, and this is for adults and children alike, uh, the, the more likely you are to have negative health impacts, psychological health impacts from an experience of trauma. So we've all experienced COVID-19 in different ways. And if you have children who have other vulnerabilities through their family, or they've experienced, say, family violence during the pandemic, uh, that's obviously increasing uh, their level of risk. And so that for us as, as, as people who work in schools, that gives us clues as to who, who are the populations who maybe we need to keep an eye on and, and and focus on in our intervention and the things that we do. So this is just an idea of a, a review that we did where we looked at what has the past pandemic literature said around the impacts of, of um, pandemics and, and COVID-19. Uh, and it, it's noted there as well that uh, prior trauma and prior mental health issues obviously do increase risk for children and for adults. Uh, and I've also noted there that prior exposure to events, but it's really important to remember, particularly for primary school age children, they, they tend to overemphasize and not understand the level of risk posed to them. So it's really important to, to think about when we're thinking about particularly children, uh, what, what thoughts are they having about their potential to be impacted by COVID or their potential to be impacted by a disaster? They tend to catastrophize a little bit more and overemphasize the level of risk. So you might say, well, the disaster was really far away and, and that might be how you think about it as an adult. But particularly for younger children, we found that they tend to overestimate uh, how at risk they are. So even if they're, they're not that close to the event th themselves. Uh, this is just emphasising a little bit more from the literature. So again, I've mentioned some of those risk factors, also a family history of, of mental illness and, and that prior trauma experience. And we're learning this over the next couple of years, five years, I'm sure we're going to learn more. What, what the current literature is saying is that there's a psychological impacts, but also there's these learning impacts as well. And you can see the kids that are, uh, are potentially going to be more impacted from COVID, school lockdowns in relation 
relation to their learning are again kids who are more vulnerable from disadvantaged backgrounds with a history of mental health difficulties or their parents have mental health difficulties or they had limited access to online learning platforms limited familiarity with online platforms and kids with disability as well. So again, we're looking at kids who, who are the most vulnerable and the most at risk, either from a, a mental health um, or a, a learning and a school disengagement uh, perspective. Really important not to forget um, educators and school staff. So part of our work has also been to talk to school staff. We've done studies uh, with early childhood educators, teachers in schools, and also we've looked at psychologists and counsellors in schools as well. Uh, and no surprises that they're, they're obviously concerned uh, about the impact of the pandemic on, on families themselves and, and children. And what we've found is that educators and school staff have reported their own psychological distress and their own um, impacts of wellbeing. Uh, increased workload, that goes without saying over the course of the pandemic and how that cycles around and, and impacts uh, wellbeing of staff as well. The inability to perform normal duties was also noted, and this was particularly among the psychologists and the counsellors. So the, at the point in time when we needed psychologists and counsellors to be able to do their job during the pandemic, they actually had more like a limited capacity to be able to perform their normal duties. And now what we're finding with psychologists is now they have a backlog of clients that they couldn't work with during the pandemic, that they're now trying to work with those clients. And so any additional um, children that need support and families that need support are facing very long wait lists uh, to, to get in to see a psychologist. So, Moving on from, from the pandemic, the reason I put the pandemic and disasters is because, as I said, uh, we really are noticing similar impacts and similar at-risk groups. But with disasters and with the pandemic uh, and everything we've spoken about, there's also the importance of considering the disaster. So are we talking about a bushfire event? Are we talking about the recent floods that we've seen in New South Wales and Queensland? Also considering the local context, part of my work is working with uh, regional and rural communities as well as metropolitan schools. So those school contexts are very different uh, from each other. The systems in place and also, as Karen was saying, the type of training that staff have had the opportunity to participate in. This is a, a, a the Mustering Growth uh, logo that I have here is a collaboration that I've been working on with Rural Aid uh, for the past uh, year or so, uh, directly responding to this issue of developing programs with schools, for schools, with young people as well, that directly considers the, the type of context and the type of experiences that these school communities might have. So Mustering Growth is a, is a new program uh, that we've co-designed and developed with communities, uh, a social and emotional program for regional and rural communities and, and schools. So again, addressing the need that it needs to have a local response, uh, these programs and approaches. So with that in mind, what I've put together here is what I've defined as my ecological trauma-informed model. And this is really taking from all of the research that I've been doing, particularly over the last six years or so. And what you'll see from this ecological model is there's all these different layers of systems. So for a trauma-informed approach to be appropriate and, and useful and sustainable, we need to consider all of these different levels. So the first two levels, the first two lines that you'll see is, of course, we need training and, and, and support for, for staff, for educators, psychologists as well. So when we've surveyed psychologists, they also need training and support. Uh, and then that second level of collaborative support and knowledge sharing, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But we need more than that. We need more than, than information. We need more than, than support um, and training. That third level there is really looking at, well, what are the underlying systems that support educator wellbeing and support student wellbeing? So Karen and I have developed a policy, for example, that schools can use, it's freely available and they can modify uh, to suit their school context. So there's programs and policies in place for if a disaster or another pandemic happens, 
happens, the school has something that they can fall back on to use. That fourth level there is, uh, as I said, there's the risk groups, the risk factors, there's different contexts, the, the regional and rural versus metropolitan. Uh, there's other examples I'll talk about in a moment. But, but we, we need to, to think about those high risk groups and high risk families in, in any of our response. It's not a one size fits all trauma informed practice for the, the families and, and the schools that we're working with. And then that final level is preparing communities and creating a whole community level trauma informed approach. Uh, this has particularly come out of my work in uh, regional and rural uh, communities. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment the example. So what I've, I've done here is I've just mapped on exactly the same um, ecological model but I've provided some examples. So again, those first two lines, we know that we need to educate um, staff uh, and, and across all staff, it needs to be a whole school education from leadership to, to um, psychologists and everyone needs to know what their role is. Role definitions and defining roles is very important. The next level is ongoing support for staff. So we found that briefing and debriefing, so both from an emotional preparedness and a support where staff can come together and support each other, but also to share ideas and strategies uh, with each other because of course staff know their student cohort, they know the challenges and so providing opportunity to come together as a staffing team and brief and debrief uh, when children are going through a particularly challenging circumstance. That next level, the third level of culture, it needs to focus on educator and student wellbeing. As I said, Karen and I have developed a, a, a policy which um, schools can, can access freely and can, can modify. That's focusing on trauma-informed practice from a student perspective, but we've also done some work around educator wellbeing and that educator wellbeing is more than just implementing a mindfulness pro program. It needs to consider the other stresses that educators um, uh, might be going through and, and provide some supports. Uh, finally, the last two levels. So uh, keeping in mind those vulnerable communities that I've spoken about, some examples I've provided are specific approaches for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. We've, we've looked at that. We've looked at refugee families, for example, and, and, and different needs of, of those people. I've looked at people with um, autism, uh, so autistic people, and, and different strategies and approaches. So there always needs to be an individualised approach um, and, and support, more support for these vulnerable communities and, and, and prior exposure to disasters, as I've spoken about. And then finally, particularly in a regional and rural context, but I, I think this needs to be taken wider, is partnerships between communities. So rather than you know moving beyond, we need a whole school approach, but what I'm proposing here is a whole of community approach. So how do we bring in sporting clubs? Particularly if kids aren't linked in with school, they might be linked in with the sporting club. So how do we bring on coaches and volunteers into this story? Uh, and coaches and volunteers and sporting clubs are also a part of the story when we're talking about recovery from disasters and hiring people from the local community. So keeping knowledge within the local community. Uh, this could be psychologists, for example, uh, and creating those community links because trauma-informed practice is all about relationships and building relationships. These are just my final comments before I finish up. Uh, really just emphasising that education and support for staff are only two aspects of that ecological model. There are other levels that we need to think about. But we are challenged to think about this. We are challenged to develop trauma-informed res resources that respond to different contexts, schools, people and types of disasters. So this is the next stage of our work in this space as I see it. And there's not a lot that's been done. A lot of trauma-informed approaches are across whole school communities and it's a it's sort of a um, one size fits all approach. Uh, but this needs greater investment in programs across schools. And I think that goes uh, without saying. 
So I think that's all from, from me um, and, and thank you all on behalf of uh, Karen and I, you know, thank you, thank you for your attention tonight. It's always lovely to be able to do these sorts of presentations. We, we would love to hear from you. Our, our email addresses are, are listed there for both Karen and I. We would love to hear from you. We would love to hear, you know, your stories if you want to engage, uh, collaborate, uh, because we're both uh, here for the long run and we're both uh, highly passionate in this space. So, uh, Michael, uh, thank you. And I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Emily. That's fantastic. Um, we have a, f we have a lot of questions coming through, um, uh, about specific resources that you've mentioned, um, the school policy that, um, uh, that you mentioned. Um, I think we'll, we'll take a note of that as something to share with our teachers as well. Sure. Um, unless you have a, um, an easy, catchy uh, web URL that you could just rattle off. <laughs> you probably not, um, but I can easily share that. Um, okay, fantastic. To share that. We'll make sure that gets through as well. Okay, we have 15 minutes left um, as this is an hour session. Uh, so we'll try and get through some more questions if that's okay. Um, we had one from Kylie asking, and excuse me if some of these have already been um, answered yeah, in, in the chat, but just, um, I, I think we can speak to them anyway, just uh, so they're in the recording and so that everyone can hear a bit of conversation. Um, uh, one from Kylie asking, at what age are you able to see trauma in young children and what might be some of the signs? Yeah, um, that, that's a, a great question. So what a child's so we would define it in the early years we would define it as uh, attachment and a child's attachment to a primary caregiver is determined within the first year of life so if a child has experienced um inconsistent parenting disruptive parenting um, a parent that's not able to respond to their needs for various that the parent might be experiencing their own trauma so they can't respond to the child's needs or the parent might be incapable they might have a prior history of trauma or mental health difficulties as, as a few examples so that first year of life is is a key period for developing attachment uh, and then later in life, attachment difficulties uh, present very similar to um, trauma and, and trauma-based responses. So, and, and it sets a child up for the, for the potential to experience future traumas. So they're cumulative attachment and trauma, they're cumulative. And, and the more you experience those challenges, the more likely you are to experience those challenges later in life. So very early. Thanks, Emily. Um, Karen, uh, we had a couple just uh, going back to uh, your comment about uh, a connection between trauma and ADHD. Um, mm. Maura was asking, sorry, Maura was asking, do you think that trauma is often misdiagnosed as ADHD or other behavioural diagnoses? Look, it's really interesting um, and it's a very good question. Uh, what I've started to um, find out in the literature um, and the research in this area is that children who have ADD, uh, ADHD or ADD and oppositional defiance disorder, for example, are more likely to have experienced trauma. So uh, is it misdiagnosed? Probably not. It is likely that the children do have those outcomes um, and trauma has potentially in increased their risk of those outcomes. Um, and the clear relationships haven't been um, identified yet with the research, but there's some theories as to um, how trauma does um, create an increased risk of these um, mental health outcomes. I think something um, that is really important to potentially understand is that ADHD is actually underdiagnosed. People think it's overdiagnosed, but it's actually quite prevalent. Um, and it's often underdiagnosed in, in girls. Um, it displays differently often in girls as well. But the problem with not diagnosing it correctly is if you miss the diagnosis, 
um, and children, they're, uh, they're experiencing an environment where um, their ADHD is not recognised, they're often punished um, or dismissed or ignored. And it can lead to very, very negative outcomes. Um, and in fact, uh, <sighs> to the point that it increases um, your risk of suicide. And in fact, there is a re uh, some research demonstrating people with ADHD have increased risk of suicide as well. So it's really important to, I guess, understand um, those relationships between trauma and these um, behavioural or mental health problems because those comorbidities or existing um, diseases that exist together and experiences are really impactful. Um, so, and as Emily just talked about, that accumulation or cumulative um, impact is really important to understand because I think what happens for a lot of children as well, they experience trauma, they may have a mental health um, diagnosis, behavioural issues, and they can then be further traumatised in the school, particularly if the teachers don't um, know that there's particular triggers for these children as well. One thing I did want to comment on um, is to really, something that I try and I guess highlight is often, we don't know if someone's experienced trauma. Um, the children often don't know themselves and they may not know till they're an adult. They may never know. Um, and adversity that a child experiences in their home is just normal for them. Um, and so the fact that they behave differently in the school um, is probably something they don't quite understand themselves. They probably feel misunderstood different, um, when we make these children feel more different than what they already feel, then that can actually further exacerbate the problem. And the kids, I, I noticed, sorry, Michael, just to go on to looking at some of the questions, and I've, we've been asked a lot of questions about severely aggressive or, or um, lots of students who are, who are misbehaving and really difficult. And I certainly don't want to minimise that. Oh, it is an absolute struggle, particularly in some schools where we have high disadvantage, high domestic violence. Um, and I've been, we've been asked, you know, what what are some strategies to help these kids? And one of the best things that you can do is develop good relationships with them. Now, these kids are often not likable. Um, especially the kids who display aggression um, in response to their trauma. But just persistence, just keep going with those conversations, those casual conversations with these kids every day, um, asking them how they are, if they ignore you, try a different tact. But those relationships are what will help those children. They'll help them not just in their emotional regulation, but also in their behaviour. And then they start to feel a connection with the teacher. They get improved connectedness to school um, and someone cares about them. And, and that is probably um, something that's vital for children, particularly if they experience domestic violence, neglect at home, et cetera. Can I add to that, Michael, because um, Karen just reminded me of something in terms of the developing relationships. And, and some of you may have heard of this before, but there's the three principles of unconditional positive regard, congruence, and, and empathy. And so having those three things in place and, and persisting over time, as Karen said, and it really is a struggle and a, and a persistence. And it might just be that the child is connecting with one educator. And so we're gonna open up their window of tolerance. That one educator maybe over time might become two or three or four, but it might just be one for now that they have a connection with, something that they have a shared interest. For example, you might just connect on a shared interest with a young person. Uh, so those principles of unconditional positive regard, I'm going to regard you highly, even though your behaviour sometimes is, is not appropriate or not expected. We, we call it unexpected behaviours, not bad behaviours, because that's quite triggering for kids. It's, it's unexpected, unexpected behaviours. So unconditional positive regard 
regard. Empathy, so showing empathy and kindness and, and caring. And congruence, being genuine, being genuine in your desire to want to get to know the young person and your desire to want to have conversations about things that are of interest to them, which is why sometimes kids who have experienced trauma will connect with one educator and one educator alone, because it's likely that that teacher has a shared interest or has 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 had a similar um, has a similar interest that they can they can talk about. So they're sort of the the, the pillars of, of developing relationships. Thank you for that, Emily and Karen. Um, uh, you've jumped into my next couple of questions that I'd <laughs> picked out, um, but I also had a poll prepared around uh, behaviour management as well. So if uh, the teachers uh, wanted to click through to that poll, um, this poll asks how trauma informed are the behaviour management strategies in your school? And I'll give you a moment to have a look at that. Um, we are very, very quickly running out of time. Um, I had a a question towards the end that um, uh, is probably a webinar all on its own, uh, but it comes from Kari and she asked the best ways to support intergenerational trauma with Indigenous people. I can um, I, I can speak to that uh, a little Thanks, bit. Uh, there, there, there's still work ongoing. Um, and and Karen and I are lucky enough to be able to be involved in in some of that work. Uh, look, relationships. I mean, it's important to keep in mind that intergenerational trauma is is there, and also whether families feel safe. Now, there there will be families, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, for example, who feel who don't feel safe in schools, and certainly it will take time for them to feel safe in schools. So you're starting from a very low base of of safety and and that sense of safety and relationships at relationships, as Karen has said. So building up from that point uh, is very challenging. We talk about culturally informed, trauma-informed practices. So things such as uh, the work that we've done representing um, different cultures and different communities in the, the days that you celebrate, the, the artwork around the school flag. So representation, people seeing themselves represented in the school and that it's a place that they belong and it's a place that they're included and, and actively included as well. So that's that's where they, you know, communities that have been marginalised and disadvantaged need that little bit of extra attention and care to ensure that they do feel safe and, and comfortable uh, in the same way that um, people, other people have felt safe and, and comfortable, um, you know, for a long time. It's, it's definitely a, a larger topic for another day, I think. <laughs> um, uh, we probably have just time for one final question. Um, uh, this one came from another Emily in the room. Um, and this one was about uh, confidentiality, um, about management not being able to share d details about um, the situation that a child might be in. How might we bridge the gap of understanding of the trauma of the child without um, infringing on that confidentiality? Um, it's it's really important not to make any promises to the young person. And this comes back to that idea of honesty and, and congruence. So a child might disclose something to you and say, you know, please don't tell, please don't tell. It's really important for educators. And I have to do this myself as a psychologist. Confidentiality is obviously something I operate within. Um, it's really important for educators uh, not to, to, to make promises um, that, or, or for anyone to make promises around keeping things secret because, of course, in all of our roles, our primary um, goal is, is to keep young people safe, um, so to keep, keep everyone safe. So that's probably my first recommendation around confidentiality. Uh, and look, there's not really a lot that's been written in this space. I do believe in the book that well, I'll send the link for, I do believe there is a chapter on ethics for educators. As I said, I, I would speak about ethics from a psychologist's perspective, which, which would be a slightly different lens. Karen, I don't know if anything comes to mind for you when you think about confidentiality. 
Um, look, I think it is an interesting topic and it's always, um, when we do professional development sessions, it's always brought up as an issue. Um, I think the increased um, desire to share information between different services um, and different teachers um, is high. I think um, one, one thing that, again, I just want to reiterate is that Sometimes you often you don't really need to know what's gone on in a child's past if they're displaying very difficult behaviours and very um, unexpected behaviours, as um, Emily mentioned, then you can suspect quite highly that they've had a pretty tough time, um, whether or not that's at home in the community, whatever. What is important is to find out what helps that child what triggers that child and what to do when a child responds in a way that is um, unsafe or unsettling or potentially um, as someone, um, one of the questions was, you know, traumatising other children in the classroom. And that's important, you know, we need all children to feel safe. Um, so even though we might not know the details of what's happened, we need to find out how to work with this children, this child, remembering that what works for one child won't necessarily work for another. And um, one of the questions is, what do we do if a child's particularly triggered? Um, and something that is good to do is give them options like, um, do you want to go for a walk on the oval? Should we go sit in a quiet office and talk? Um, is there a teacher we could go and talk to, for example, if it's lunchtime, whatever. But at the time that a child's triggered, they're often too emotional to make a decision. So you might have to guide them. But when they've calmed down, maybe the next day, you say, if that happens again, what do you think would be the best thing that we can do? So I guess I'm sort of going off track a little bit, but... Um, we often feel that knowing a child's background will really help, but um, knowing what will help them is probably the most important thing. Um, and like I said, for some child, for some children, they could experience really tough times at home, um, but they're okay. But other kids can experience a few really um, bad situations at home and not be okay. So um, it's important to remember that, I think. Thank There's you so, so many much. good questions. Yeah. I want to answer them yep. all. I'm just going, <laughs> I'm typing away and I'm thinking, oh, they're just, they're all really good questions. And some of them are we really have, good. We have run out of time. Um, I, know. I I will gather these questions together and right. I'll send them to the both of you and um, uh, we'll make sure we do something with the unanswered ones. Um, right. In the meantime, uh, after this session is finished, if I've set it up correctly, you should um, all be redirected to our uh, Facebook group Teacher Talk. And um, if you have any further questions that you wanted to uh, post and get through to Karen and Emily, um, you could post them there or even just have a conversation amongst yourselves um, uh, about any uh, anything that you found has worked for you. Um, I'm going to have to call it there. Thank you all so much for joining and contributing to the conversation tonight. This has been fantastic. Huge thanks to Emily and Karen for their time tonight. I know that this information is going to be very valuable uh, for everyone here and hopefully for some more people who watch the recording um, and, and keep talking about this stuff. Um, I'm going to send out the recording later tonight along with um, some of the resources that were mentioned by our guests um, and uh, uh, I, I will probably follow up again um, uh, once we've got them all properly collated together. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you all again. Uh, have a fantastic Friday, everyone. And um, thanks again, Emily and Karen. Thank you. It's been great. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.